everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to tonight's book launch. We're really delighted to be launching the book, The New Internationalists, Activist Volunteers in the European Refugee Crisis. It's been written and edited by Sue Clayton and introduced by Alf Dobbs. And tonight's launch is hosted by Bookmarks. Uh, the publishers are Goldsmiths Press and MIT Press, and it's uh, going to be available from major and independent uh, suppliers. My name's Sarah Tomlinson. I'm a teacher uh, and union activist and have been a campaigner around refugee rights. And I'm delighted to be here to chair and to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is going to be uh, Alf Dobbs, Lord Alf Dobbs, uh, the amazing campaigner, uh, former child refugee and indefatigable uh, spokesperson for refugees uh, trying to get to a better place. So I'm really delighted to introduce Alf, who's going to have uh, 10 to 15 minutes to speak. Thanks, Alf. Right, good evening, and thank you very much indeed for inviting me to this important occasion. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I was honoured to be asked to write a little introduction to the book, uh, and and uh, and this is, this is really an important day. Uh, just to say a word about Sue, I seem to have known Sue for a long, long time. She's one of the many activists and campaigners I've met. She's always bought popping up here and there, but let me say a little bit about her. She's an academic. I've learned a lot more about her in, in the last year or two. She's an academic at Goldsmiths. Uh, she's a film and documentary maker. She's an author, as this book shows, and other books, and she's an activist. And it's as an activist I first got to know her. Uh, she's um, uh, she, she launched a, a tremendous conference, a two-day conference, about a year and a half ago in North, North Lewisham in Deptford. Tremendous event, all her, all her own doing. And, of course, how she managed to put this book together with so many contributors, there's so much in it, that itself was an absolute feat for which I congratulate her. Now, I'm going to say just a little bit about the, about the refugee situation. You'll be familiar with it, but let's remind ourselves. <laughs> it seems... It seems a lifetime ago, and I think it was about four, four and a half years ago, that we first um, learned about the tragedy in Syria and the number of Syrians who were fleeing to safety to, to other, other parts of the region and indeed heading for Europe. And that's when we learned, as you'll remember, that there are 95,000 95, unaccompanied child refugees somewhere in Europe, mainly in France, Greece and Italy. And 10,000 of those had disappeared. So I, I was talking to colleagues in Parliament, and it happened an immigration bill was going through, and I put my amendment down uh, that we should take some of these children. Uh, and the government didn't like it, uh, and I was asked by the then Home Secretary, Theresa May, to withdraw my amendment. And her words were, I said, why should I? And her words were, well, if you don't withdraw this amendment, other children will follow. And I said to her with real astonishment. Do you mean to say we're going to turn our backs on children, particularly children sleeping in the jungle as it then was in Calais or on the Greek islands? We just can't turn our backs on them. Anyway, it, 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 um, it passed the Lords by a big majority, slightly defeated in the Commons, went back to the Lords as a bigger majority, and then something very significant happened. <coughs> public opinion woke up to what was going on. And public opinion manifests itself in pressure on MPs to support the amendment. It manifests itself in people shouting at me in the street, not abuse, which is sometimes what I'd expect, but the support and solidarity. And all over the country, groups are being set up in local areas to, 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 to support refugees and to welcome refugees. And that was terrific. And that pressure made the government give way and they accepted the amendment. And then there was a second strand to all this, which was the Dublin Treaty. And you'll know it's an EU treaty under part of which a child in one EU country can apply to join family and relatives in another. So a Syrian boy in France could apply to join an uncle in London or in Birmingham. <coughs> and that's what I was fairly straightforward. Now, the government have actually resisted both of those amendments. They resisted the first one, and there was an answer to a parliamentary question in the Commons only on last Friday, uh, which basically said they're shutting it down. Their excuse was that after taking 480 children, a small number, after taking those, there are no more local authority uh, places in foster homes, well, in, in foster, with foster families. Well, um, all I can say is we found 
quite a few local authorities who were willing to take quite a lot of children through their foster families. So that, that didn't stand up. And then on the second one, the government have, have uh, uh, turned down an amendment which passed the first time in 2017, which then, um, which, which then uh, was reversed in 2019, quite shockingly. And that's basically what I call the family reunion amendment. And although the government say there is a limited way in which this can still happen, it's not much good, I think. And so we, we've got a big battle ahead and we'll go on doing it. And there'll be some more legislation coming, uh, I believe, in, in, in the course of the next few months. And we'll get another amendment down to see if we can strengthen the position of, of refugees so that that's the position that's the situation there now uh, in the course of all this i've had a chance to visit calais the jungle before it was pulled down and then subsequently i've had the, uh, the chance to go to greece and I've, I've been to lesbos to moya camp about a year before that terrible fire there i saw these conditions and they were deeply deeply shocking uh, and the thought that our fellow human beings, particularly children, but others as well, are having to exist in such miserable conditions, it's pretty awful. Uh, and I, I, found that, I found that very, 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 very depressing. Now, um, I also uh, went on one occasion to um, Jordan, to Zatari. Now, that's physically a much better camp, 80,000 people in it. Physically a better camp because they've got sanitation, they've, they've got prefab buildings and so on. But what it lacks... And this, this came out when I was talking to a, a Syrian boy of about um, um, about 16 or 17. He just finished his education in the camp. And I said, what now? And he said, well, I, I tried to get a job in the camp. I can't. Uh, I tried to get a job outside the camp and I can't. What hope is there for me here? And it's this lack of hope which I think has characterized the predicament of many refugees the world over, not just the ones in Europe. And I think human beings can put up with an awful lot if there's some hope for them. But where there is no hope, then we're really shutting, shutting the door on any opportunity they may have to lead decent lives, to get education, to lead the sort of lives that we're all able to lead. So it's this lack of hope, which I think is crucial. And that's why we have a responsibility as campaigners to do all the things we can to give people in these refugee camps and elsewhere a hope. In Calais, it's no longer a refugee camp, it's people sleeping under tarpaulins uh, un, un, under the trees. And the, the latest situation, the latest situation uh, we've heard is right in Bosnia, where just recently they apparently, and you may hear more about it in a subsequent from a subsequent speaker, there were a thousand refugees in a camp, and they were turned out. They closed the camp down. They turned them out into the snow, and nobody knows what's happening. And of course, because of the pandemic, it's very difficult to go there and visit and draw the world's attention to what's happening. So that's an, that's another thing that is absolutely despairing. And of course, we've got the situation in the barracks in um, in, in Folkestone, uh, which again are pretty awful. Again, we read about it in the papers, terrible conditions in which these people are living, and, uh, and even when they've managed to get across the channel. Now, one of the things that has made me feel very positive, and this is a the theme of the book, are the volunteers I've met, young people, some of them working for NGOs, uh, some of them volunteering and not, not, not even being paid uh, uh, in, in Calais, uh, in the Calais area, what was the jungle now under the trees or on the Greek islands. Young people who are giving up a year or two of their lives in order to support their most vulnerable fellow human beings. They don't get much praise. Fortunately, this book is there, which demonstrates just what wonderful things these people are doing. Otherwise, I keep saying we owe them an enormous debt of gratitude. I feel whenever I've met them, I feel both both humbled and privileged that I've met people who are willing to put themselves out for other human beings in such a fantastic way. And you know, I can, I can only say that we, we all, we all deserve to, or they deserve for us to congratulate them much more than is being done, which is why I'm so delighted by the book, because um, the book is actually saying, it's putting on record what's happening, uh, what these people have done, and what the conditions are in these, in these terrible camps. Uh, and thank you, Sue, for doing that. Uh, and I can only say that whenever I've gone to meetings, I've normally found one or two ref uh, people who've been volunteers in the camps and, and they, they attend more meetings and they're still campaigning away. But this is important. You know, in a bleak winter like this, whether it's on whether it's in on, on Lesbos or whether it's in, in, in northern France in the Calais area and elsewhere, <laughs> the volunteers are really shining a light of hope for people who are very vulnerable and more vulnerable than, um, than, uh, than almost anybody else. I just say, uh, just say one other thing. 
I think the world has got to come to terms with this in a way we haven't done properly. Uh, too many countries are saying, we don't want these people. We're trying to keep down the numbers. The government, our government says, oh, well, we've had so, a few 5,000 that came. Yeah, but why did they come? They were ones that could have come anyway if a legal path had been open. And the reason they the, the reason they take such a chance is because if there's no legal way of getting to safety and they want to join their families in Britain in particular, then they do what we would all do, which is to try and get here by other means on the back of a lorry or on a dinghy. Dangerous. And that's why I argue constantly, we've got to give people legal paths to safety. Refugees have been through the most terrible experiences to remind people in this country. And I think essentially British people are humanitarian. If we put the argument about children and what they've been through, then British people say, yeah, well, yeah, maybe it's a good idea. Maybe we can, we can take some of them. I was talking some time ago to a Syrian boy who'd seen his father killed in front of him by a bomb in Aleppo or Damascus. Now, how can one go on living a normal life if one has seen this happen to one's father or to a parent? And, and we've got to remember, people have been through the most terrible, terrible experiences. And anything we can do to help them lead decent lives in this country or in other countries is positively good, which is why I think Europe as a whole should step up to the mark. We can't leave it to Germany and a bit to Sweden. We've all, as Europeans, and we're still Europeans even if we're not in the EU, as Europeans, we've got to, uh, we've got to step up to the mark and say yes, uh, we will, we will, we will do more, and we want to do it as part of Europe, and we'll share responsibility, not just leave it to the accident of geography uh, that more arrive in Greece and Italy and Malta than than elsewhere. So these are our responsibilities. And as I, as I said earlier, I think a book like this draws attention to the situation. There's some very dramatic photographs of what it's like in the camps, uh, brought back to me memories of when, I, of when I went to Calais on previous occasions. And I think it's important, it bears repeating, we must keep public opinion on our side. If we're going to change things and put pressure to bear on the government, we have to have public opinion, understanding what we're about, which is why the book comes in. It's a helpful way of explaining, an important way of explaining what is going on. So thank you again for what you're doing. I think it's very, very important. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sue, for your constant efforts. Thank you to all your all campaigners here. Together, we can still make governments change. We've got to let our voices be heard. And this is tonight we're letting our voice be heard and we'll go on letting our voice be heard in the future. So thank you very much indeed and good luck to you as campaigners. Thank you. Thank you so much, Al, for your inspiring words. And, and, and obviously, I'm sure I convey the thanks of everybody here. And I can see comments that are coming up on social media thanking you for, for uh, everything that you do to, to campaign. Um, I'm going to introduce Sue, who's going to be our next speaker. But just to uh, say how I met Sue, uh, we campaigned in our union, the National Education Union, um, around refugee rights and anti-racism uh, and that included in 2016 going over to Calais and taking groups of people to teach in what was the jungle. Uh, that started uh, for me uh, a, a, a long-term uh, commitment to going over to taking as many people as possible to opening people's eyes to the fact that just 20 miles from our shore, there were people living uh, abandoned uh, in a situation which actually our government was uh, a, a, a mostly responsible for. So we thought it was our duty to shine a light on the issue, to get people to come meet refugees, hear their stories, uh, and, and to go back as educators to talk in schools, to, to children, to parents, to families, to say I've been to Calais and I've I, I've um, I've met refugees and I understand uh, some of the of the issues and and it was going over there that I met Sue and uh, the film that she she made uh, the Calais children uh, absolutely amazing film that we again used uh, and we showed at our national conference and we showed wherever we, we could to uh, raise the issues and. Uh, in the book, I think there are some stories and photos of some of our um, activists and campaigners going over uh, and and telling telling their stories too. So I'm also grateful, and I'm also grateful in the middle of the pandemic when it seems like there's just one thing that we can worry about to actually bring the light back on to this problem, which hasn't gone away and and really deserves 
our attention. So, Sue, I'm going to ask you to just talk a little bit about your work and the book, and um, we look forward to hearing that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Am I? Can you hear me okay here? Yeah, I'm assuming you can. You can, Sarah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, thanks so much to Elf and to all of the speakers and to everyone that's tuned in. This will be this will stay live on YouTube if you know anyone else that wants to watch it later. So thanks so much for showing an interest. As Sarah says, it's it's so hard to keep this in the public um, space. The, the refugee crisis hasn't gone away. There are hundreds of thousands of people still trapped in different parts of Europe and the volunteers are still doing a massive, massive job. I just have to say very quickly a piece of great news that happened today if people haven't heard. The Stansted 15 had their appeal and they won. <laughs> they were accused of a terrorist crime and they fought and fought and fought for two and a half years and today the High Court threw out the, the charge completely. So a huge congratulations to them. It's on Channel 4 News tonight because I also made a film with them and the film's showing on Channel partly on Channel 4 tonight. So that's a bit of good good news and a bit of light in the darkness. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I won't talk too much about my my background, just that I am a filmmaker. And as Alf says, I, I write about this issue and I campaign and I visit people in detention and all the things all of us do. So I'm I'm not I'm not you know different from anyone else in all those ways. But I just decided I had to commit to write this book because in all the work I was doing, whether it's welcoming in this country whether it's being in Calais and Palermo, all sorts of places where I've, I've been working, I realised that there was a whole new wave, if you like, a whole new movement that was growing. And in these days, you know, the idea that there's a whole new mass political movement, a humanitarian movement that's grown and developed, you know, just the way we look at Extinction Rebellion is hugely, hugely good news and hugely important. And so, um, as I've said, I felt just compelled to document everyone's stories. And I just want to say quickly, I'm going to read a bit from the book, but I just want to say that, you know, the volunteers almost entirely don't want the glory. They don't want to necessarily even always be thanked. You know, it's like everyone's trying to point the attention at, you know, the, the new arrivals, you know, the, the people who are coming that, that need help and need our solidarity. Um, but I do think they have to be thanked and supported. And we also, we as the volunteer movement have to look at ways to strengthen ourselves and gather even more strength and sustain ourselves and, and keep going for the very long term. You know, this wasn't just a temporary crisis. It's, it's with us for the future. Um, so I'm thanking all the volunteers, whether they like it or not, <laughs> in being thanked. <laughs> um so I'm going to read, firstly, I'm just going to read the preface, which is really short. Um, and then I'm going to read two or three of the stories, because what I did to write this book was um, I, I put the word around and I was I was one of the um, speakers at the refugee summit that um, Alf mentioned. I wasn't the organiser, but I was speaking at it. And we put the word around to say, you know, whether it's a big political point you want to make, whether it's a personal story, whether it's something about your own struggle, whether it's about you becoming more politicised, which definitely we all did on this journey. Um, we were all educating ourselves more and more as we went along. You know, all those different steps, you know, please just write it down in whatever form and send it. So I've got over 180 testimonies of which I've used about a third in the book and the rest will be available in the online version of the book. And that's the core of it. I hate to say it's Channel 4 News ringing, but too bad, they're going to have to wait. Um, and so, yeah, that's the core of the book. And then I realised that it was very important, because nobody else had done it yet, to actually try and flesh out factually what was happening in Bosnia, what was happening in um, Ventimiglia, you know, what was happening in Lampedusa. Because, you know, you were getting such a fragmented version from the press. And a lot of stuff, of course, just wasn't in the press at all. So we've I went from writing a book that was human testimonies, which still are in my heart and always will be, I'm going to read you some of them in a minute, to actually then constructing around those testimonies in the book um, the whole history of the refugee crisis. Now, I probably wasn't the most qualified person to do that, but you know what it's like when you start, you just keep going. And I've had so many people who've written chapters and who've written sections and have written reports um, so we've sort of, without having set off to do that, actually written the history of the last five years. Um, 
So I just I just hope it's useful um, both in terms of solidarity and in terms of information that can that can be used. Um, it, it won't be perfect, but you know our hearts were were there. So I'm going to quickly read the introduction because some of you know some of you know a lot about this topic. Some others maybe don't in in detail what the volunteers were doing. So I'll read you the preface very quickly. It's about three four minutes. And then I'm going to read four of the testimonies that I was sent that are in the book. Okay, so the the the, the bit I'm not going to read because I'm sure you do all know this is just the general scale of the refugee crisis, the fact that you know over forty thousand people drowned in our seas, you know many within sight of at the shores of Europe, which is the thing that drives me every day of my life to keep working on this. It's it's you know we can't live with that. We can't be that place, um, and. It seemed that apart from the odd country like Germany, Sweden, you know, Portugal, some countries were helpful. Italy was helpful and then wasn't helpful. Um, <laughs> Salvini. Um, mainly there was confusion. Uh, there was a lot of indifference. And then there was a lot of open state hostility. And I think most volunteers had this same reaction that I had time and time again. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I thought this cannot be Europe. I can't be witnessing you know, tens of thousands of people starving and, you know, without shelter um, and, and dying, you know. Um, and this is what the volunteers walked into. So this is my little, little song of praise to them <laughs> that I wrote in the introduction. I came to understand firsthand that set against the generalised hostility, there has been a powerful new force, the flowering of what I have called here the activist volunteer movement, a grassroots mobilization of people of every age, skill, faith and background who as individuals or in groups responded to a humanitarian crisis that neither governments nor the larger aid agencies seemed willing or able to address. Local citizens responded to people arriving at their coasts, their ports, borders and stations. Thousands of others packed up and traveled to the hot spots like Calais and Lesvos from across Europe and beyond. Tens of thousands more collected goods and raised funds to supply the camps provided welcome and settlement support at final destinations and campaigned for legal and civil rights. And many refugees themselves committed as well to build support networks for those arriving after them. Between them, this mobilization, which I estimate as being half a million people across Europe, sourced hundreds of thousands of tents and trainers and waterproofs, baby clothes, sanitary towels and sleeping bags. They built huts, they put up tents, they cooked thousands of meals a day and sourced clean water. They cut hair, charged phones and cleaned toilets. They gave legal and medical advice and support. They set up creches, language classes, therapy, music, theatre and arts. When EU and member state rescue missions withdrew from the Mediterranean, they scoured the sea for shipwrecks, then faced arrest for saving lives. They were abused and tear gassed by police in the makeshift camps. They listened to a million stories and laughed and wept with each person who told them. They drank endless cups of tea with the new arrivals in cold, leaky tents. And when people got to some kind of permanent settlement, they found them cots and pillowcases, played football with them, fasted and broke bread and prayed with them. They battled the state for help and for refugee rights. They railed against governments for not providing all this aid. And they railed against themselves and each other for making mistakes, for not doing enough, for not doing more. They brought corpses out of the sea so that families could have closure. They helped bury the dead and mourn with those grieving and repatriated bodies back home. What they did and continue to do was and is in every way truly extraordinary and demands to be documented. And they document and still do in incredibly dangerous situations, continued state and police abuse to this day all over Europe, abuse of refugees, but increasingly abuse against volunteers as well. I mean, in Calais, you know, you could be put in jail, a volunteer could be put in jail for offering food to a child. That's how bad it's been. Sorry, that's just me. As well as what they did, they bore unique witness to a crisis that is one of Europe's most shameful episodes. And their testimonies hold vital knowledge that the world needs to hear. They continue to fight and campaign and to feed and ferry people, even as states have become to, begun to criminalise their actions. And in my experience, they do these things overwhelmingly, not out of some grandiose idea of white saviorism or some cliche of doing good, but because they believe that all of our humanity depends on how we treat those who need our help, especially when our own countries and governments may have contributed to the disasters in theirs. 
They seek to accept and support the new arrivals. And to do that, they argue that we must all dismantle the pernicious borders in our own minds, the us and them, the ideological walls that separate us as much as do the concrete walls, checkpoints and fences that have come to haunt this new Europe. This book is for them and for our new arrivals in solidarity. <laughs> well, I got almost to the end with that blobbing. So there you go. Um, that's my thank you to them. Um, and so now I'm just going to read. I'm going to read a couple of stories. Um, one of them's a little difficult to hear, the second one. But there's a balance in these stories of hope, optimism and courage and humour and you know, we're all going to keep going. We're all going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to keep winning this fight. So um, I shall stop feeling weepy and just get on with it here. Um, so as we know, especially out on the Greek islands, there was a massive need because literally thousands of people were turning up on beaches every day and there was just nothing, literally nothing there at all initially to welcome them. Um, this is from Brendan Woodhouse, who I think a huge number of British volunteers know him. He's a firefighter from the Midlands, from the Peak District. Um, and this particular story has become quite famous. Um, it's not just the rescue that he did. It's little elements that you'll pick up, which is kind of what the book's about. It's about little clues to uh, kind of humanity. So Brendan Woodhouse, this is me in his voice. I took a week in December 2015. I took a week's leave from work and went to Lesvos. I met some people in a cafe. There's no organization then. I met some people in a cafe who said Lighthouse Refugee Relief needed a volunteer medic, and that was it. I didn't see my room again till the day I left. On my last night, I was on lookout at the lighthouse. The sky was awash with stars as I sat looking across at Turkey on the horizon, waiting for sunrise. Then at 5:50 a.m., I saw a boat coming in fast. It was still dark, but I could see tiny lights of phones come on as they tried to guide themselves to shore. I had no time to warn them, just raise the alarm. I woke Heckler, our Dutch team leader, pointed at the boat, and then boom, the tubes of the rubber boat had hit the rocks and exploded, causing it to capsize. They were piercing screams as the lights from their phones flew through the air. Then darkness and silence as the precious cargo of the boat hit the water. What the fuck? What the fuck? shouted Helka. Oh shit, no time for conversation. I zipped up my wetsuit and flew down the cliffs. Heckler went back to get the others. Against everything I knew about water rescue, I waded in, knowing that here the rules were going to save nobody. I could hear names being yelled out, desperate families trying to find each other, children just screaming. It was unforgettably horrible. Soon I was out swimming. A woman was screaming over and over and over, a really anguished wail. When the boat had capsized, she, like the others, had been catapulted into the air and then thrown down into the sea. And in that moment, she'd lost the baby she'd been holding. A woman, her sister, was trying to drag her back to the shore, but she wouldn't move to safety. Her arms were outstretched to the sea. There was a floating stack of possessions on the sea, bags, ripped off life jackets, blankets, all covered in spilled fuel. I swam at the things floating away, not having a clue what to do. Thankfully, the first bag I came to, that was it, a small baby. Her eyes were in the back of her head, her lips were blue. My heart, even today, four years on, is racing when I think of how terrible that felt. I swam on my back, baby on my chest. I did little compressions quickly on her chest as I swam, thinking it might just do something. I shouted at a god I didn't even believe in. Fucking help me now. This baby doesn't deserve this. I was momentarily pulled under, gulping the sea, thinking I was going to die, but just getting closer to the cliffs at the bottom of Caracas. At last, my head was out of the water, and I held the baby up and tilted her mouth towards mine. Five rescue breaths for infants, I remembered. I blew the first, nothing. On the second, seawater came out of her nose and mouth and she screamed. I still can't believe it happened. The little sound of bubbles in her scream, a slight froth on her face. Hecla was wading towards me, her long dreadlocks bouncing as she came. She was angry with me for swimming so far out, but also she was crying because she thought I'd been pulled under and not made it back. We've got to keep going, she said. But I was done, so she told me to go to the doctor. She turned and went off, pulling people out of the sea. Heckler was 19 years old herself, but she led us all as a team really, really well, and we trusted her. I dragged myself off the, off the, up the cliff path to the medical room, a battered old building that our team had tried to make usable. I remembered how my own daughter had donated baby hats and blankets for me for my early Christmas present before I left and quickly wrapped the baby up. 
the volunteer doctor was able to cannulate the baby and get her oxygen. This is the part I find so interesting. I look down at this tiny baby wrapped in blankets and a hat donated by a girl in Derbyshire. The oxygen had been bought with money donated by Derbyshire Refugee Solidarity. I thought about how the baby was here because someone had paid for my flights and accommodation just to get me here. The glass jar in the white lion in Beeston had collected change from people's drinks. Little things like that had made all of this happen. The baby's mum and sister arrived. They'd heard a baby had been found, and when they saw her with a mask, they broke down thinking she was dead. I pulled the mask off for a minute and let them cuddle. Then I realised my flight was due to leave, and someone bundled, bundled me back in a car to the airport. On the plane, I sat down in shock. I put my head in my hands. My hair was still wet from the sea. I'd left my mobile phone in the pocket of a coat I'd given someone, but Matt, who arranged the transport on Lesbos, called a woman volunteer on my flight to pass on the message that ba the baby Suin, she was called, was with her mother and they were in hospital together. She'd made it. So that is the sort of moment, obviously, you know, we think thank you to the people, the Derbyshire Solidarity, you know, that's the whole chain of events that made me want to write the book, that just putting some, you know, spare change in a in a jar in a pub in in derbyshire went right the way through the world and made that happen so that's i hope you can all take um inspiration from that the other three are a bit shorter because i know i shouldn't take up too much time when i get to the other speakers um from christina quintano who again a lot of people know she um she's a resident of norway she's originally from malta and she's an extremely brilliant activist who's caused any amount of, you know, eruptions in, in the Norwegian government on these issues. Uh, this is what she writes. This is the very difficult one. Today I received an inquiry from one of the Norwegian tabloid papers. A Syrian grandfather has reached Norway and hasn't heard from his grandchildren since they left Turkey. The Norwegian journalist would like to know if we have seen the children, if we could help. My silent answer is yes, we have seen the children. Quintana was working on Lesvos. Yes, we have seen the children. On my phone, I have a picture of eight of them, all little children. One has a braid that hangs loosely to one side, just like me. Mm. It's become wet and she has lost her ribbon. Her skin is beautiful, almost porcelain. She looks just like a doll, almost transparent. One of the boys has his jacket glued tightly against his body and round his arms, he wears a pair of arm floats meant for a kid's pool. He has lost his football. He won't be needing it. Never again will he get to play football. I know this. His grandfather doesn't. The newspaper insists, have I seen the children? Are they safe together? Yes, they are together. They are beautiful. They are small. They are cold. They are wet. They are dead. All of them. Everyone on that damn boat was dead. That post started a massive, massive campaign. Um, and she then wrote to the Norwegian Minister for Immigration, Sylvia Listaug, and said, this is a quite famous letter called Dear Sylvie. Um, when um, Sylvie Listag was trying to restrict immigration into Norway. Dear Sylvie, if you do not want to see them in Norway, then have the decency to tell them face to face because we feel like messengers from hell on your behalf and we are speechless every time they ask through their tears where they're supposed to go next. Because the great scandal that the book talks about is, you know, the, you know, Lots of people arrived in Greece, lots of people arrived in Italy. But of course, then when the deal was done with Turkey and later a deal was done with Libya, even more shockingly, um, people couldn't continue to come. Um, but the, because a lot of the borders further north, you know, right through the Balkans and through Eastern Europe, by then were closed and countries wouldn't accept quotas of refugees anymore. Um, there are literally tens, hundreds of thousands of refugees still stuck all the way from the Greek islands right up to Croatia in appalling conditions. Um, so it's not gone away, you know, they've just become invisible. But here are two, two quotes that I hope will lift us up a bit and then, and then I will finish. Um, this is from a volunteer, Ruhi Akhtar, who was, Akhtar, who was working with Biryani and Bananas, which was a group that was on Lesvos. One of my friends from Iraq trying to seek asylum in Greece always says, Mako Rama, and he says it over and over again as if in a trance, meaning no mercy, no mercy. All I know is that I have never seen devastation like this. And if nothing else, I will tell the world their stories and I will do my best for it to reach as many people as possible. We have been buying supplies, making food packs, new arrival clothes packs, and constantly distributing for the last 10 days, 
providing for almost 2,000 people a day. Funds are at an all-time low and our warehouses don't have enough of any or even the right aid or even any aid. But what I saw today means I don't get to be weak. I don't get to give up. And again, to me, that spoke to me. You know, we, we can't. If we give up, then, you know, that's it. You know, we're not giving up. And then this is from Mahmoud Ri, who's a Syrian refugee, um, who's since became a volunteer himself in Lesbos and Athens. During my time as a volunteer, one of the greatest experiences was to see how people from different countries, backgrounds and cultures were able to communicate despite the language barrier by sharing the same hope and the belief that together we can manage any situation. My aim will always be to help those in need. I always aspire to bigger and bigger projects to help more and more people and provide them with the resources they need to help themselves. It's a really important point. I think the key to supporting refugees is to help them back onto their own feet. It is most important to believe in them and their ideas, their experiences and knowledge is crucial to building a support system for them. The only difference between you and us is merely the passport you are holding. So that is only a tiny, tiny flavour of the book, but um, I do hope you'll, you know, you will read it and laugh and cry <laughs> and, and be angry and take action and we'll be very happy to tell you some actions at the end of the session. Thanks, Sarah. Brilliant. Thank you, Sue. Very moving to hear those uh, testimonies from the from the book. Um, I'm going to introduce Ewan McLeod next. Uh, there are quite a number of speakers. Uh, Alf and Sue had longer than most people, so I will be trying to keep you to five minutes um, for the for the rest of the speakers. Uh, so Ewan, uh, who was until 2020 a senior senior advisor with the UNHCR and has worked in Afghanistan and Syria. So Ewan, over to you, thank you. So thank you, and uh, it's really a, a great pleasure to, to make a few remarks and share some thoughts at this um, event. And Alf and Sue's introduction describes much better than I ever could the contents of the book, the background and the genesis uh, and the movement of volunteers that inspired it. So I shall not speak greatly to that. Suffice so to say that the testimonies of the volunteers speak uh, very vividly to the intense experiences, the good, the bad, and sometimes really the very ugly uh, that occur during a, a humanitarian emergency. And anybody who has experienced that finds it a transformative experience for better or for worse. For me though, the book uh, represents much more than just a moving account of uh, the volunteers on the front line of this crisis. And it points to something beyond the commitment, the courage, the solidarity on the part of so many ordinary European citizens. It is for me an on the record contribution, a very important one to the first draft of a new and potentially very troubling chapter in European history. We are living in unsettled times. As Antonio Gramsci put it, the old world is dying and the new one struggles to be born. The quality of refugee protection offered by governments can act like the canary in the coal mine on human rights. When states deny the right to seek asylum and protection, when they no longer uphold their obligations under international law, and when they actively breach the most basic responsibilities to protect human life and dignity, and we cannot, any of us, pretend that the canary isn't singing and singing loudly. Refugees in 2015 were not making their way to China or to Russia or to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. They came to Europe in search of safety, security, and freedom. They came for the rule of law to protect their lives and their rights when their own governments were unable, unwilling, or maybe worse, to do so. And what they found and what they're still finding was not what they expected. And it was not one international human humanitarian refugee and even European law entitled them to. 
And it was certainly what common human decency should have offered them. To analyze what went wrong and why would require much greater time than we have this evening. In practical terms, thou know, what we have in Europe is a protracted refugee situation that now mirrors many, many others around the world. And the majority of those are in very poor developing countries where even governments there struggle to provide a decent standard of living, even for their own citizens. But time after time, in much greater numbers than we've seen in Europe, they and their people stand up in solidarity with refugees. Yet in Europe in 2021, even the provision of the most basic humanitarian assistance is proving problematic and difficult to deliver in a systematic and standard way. This occurs on the wealthiest continent in the world is really shameful. And it's damaging to global efforts to ensure that people fleeing for their lives can gain access to safety and protection. And it undermines Europe's credibility as a champion of human rights and humanitarian solidarity. Now, the engagement of the volunteers in Europe's civil society has partly redeemed this shameful situation. Notwithstanding the amazing contributions of the volunteer movement, I can't help but ask, why was this necessary? Why is it still necessary? We do now know that the events of 2015 and 2016 were exceptional. It was never the case that there were several more million Syrian refugees desperate to come to Europe. And nor were there untold, and nor are there untold millions of migrants waiting to come from Africa. And for the same reason, they have neither the inclination or the resources to do so. The fear mongering on refugees and migrant arrivals is simply unjustified. Despite the brutality of the war and its devastating consequences in Syria, two thirds of that country's population has remained at home. Refugees account for, no, for less than 10% of the estimated total of all migrants globally, 270 million, and only 0.3% of the global population. Refugee arrivals in Europe, partly in attributable to the impact of COVID last year, have been steadily declining. In 2020, they amounted to 95,000. That's a 23% drop on the previous year. But the issue and the accounting is less about statistics than about respect for the rule of law and upholding human rights. It's about ensuring that the politics of identity, division and exclusion don't dominate our public discourse. It is unclear how human mobility will evolve in the years to come, but given global inequality and climate change, we can, sure, we can be sure it will continue. So how will we manage these challenges? Through dialogue or detention? Through cooperation or coercion? Through pushbacks or progressive policies that prioritize human life over political expedience. These, I believe, are the key questions to which this important book and the remarkable contributions of the volunteer movement allude. I think it's important for all of us to stand up and do the right thing, as so many have been doing, and I'm sure will continue to do in future. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you um, very much, uh, Ewan, for, for your, your words. Um, I am going to move to Tafiq Hussain, who's um, Director of Public Law at Duncan Lewis, uh, one of the uh, people who helped with the uh, legal case in the Calais Jungle uh, film um, and uh, has been a, a huge support to, to Sue's campaign and campaigns for refugee rights. So thank you, Tafiq. Thank you, and thank you, Sue, and everyone. Um, and congratulations on this book. Um, what I want to say, and what, what I want to focus on, is what we're all witnessing now in the UK. Um, whilst this book and its brilliant contributions document the extreme and stark examples of abuse and ill treatment throughout Europe, we are seeing that in the UK, 
due to the government's harsh and dehumanizing immigration policies that asylum seekers are being ill-treated in similar ways here. The individuals that we represent having experienced rape, sexual abuse, torture, detention and interrogation in their home countries, having survived the dangerous routes um, to Europe and then getting through the countries en route to the UK, experiencing the th things documented in, in this book. They then get to the UK and here, thinking that they are finally safe, find a government ready to indefinitely detain in prison-like uh, centres or segregate asylum seekers in collective ex-military detention sites across rural remote parts of England and Wales or face indefinite detention. These open military camps are obviously re-traumatising for refugees. The Home Office, Home Office have made no assessment to check whether they are suitable for such camps. Um, it has also resulted in racist threats of serious violence against asylum seekers. And to top it all off, these camps are COVID hotspots because of social distancing and isolation simply being impossible thanks to their design. And as recently seen in Folkestone, um, in fact, today, we're seeing reports of fire. Uh, we're, we're very much hoping that no one has been hurt. And the fear mongering, as Ewan put it, comes directly from the heart of this government. Our clients have sought refuge from war, brutal torture, exploitation and persecution. And the Home Office have been told by local government, the police, the health service, and the government's own MPs to close these sort of sites down. And yet they cover their ear, their ears and press on regardless. And this book is important to highlight the human cost of this sort of government strategy we need people to speak out in the same way this book documents. It's also important to show why the narrative that this government pumps out, the, oh, why are they leaving safe European countries to come here? Well, the, the true answers are in this book. Can I just end by saying, um, you know, something about Sue? I mean, we all know about her incredible work and the book is yet another example um, but I want to emphasise to, to many of you who may not know her um, personally, um, I want to emphasise her humanity. You know, and, and I give you one example. Uh, she came to know of a brave young boy in Calais, a very vulnerable but incredibly strong and resilient refugee from Eritrea. And Sue, you never turned your back on him and what you did for him um, is, was really incredible. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Tafik, um, and um, certainly echo those um, words about Sue. Um, it's nice to see the uh, comments coming from across the world. I, I saw a comment just then from uh, someone watching in the USA, who's or someone who I remember who I met in Calais. Uh, great to, to know that we've got um, a worldwide audience. Uh, and we are going to hear from speakers uh, giving a picture from, from uh, different countries um, and, and across the world. Um, I'm very delighted to introduce Sally next, who's a fellow teacher and campaigner in, in, our, in our union, the NEU, and a, and a fellow campaigner in Stand Up to Racism, and who has uh, jointly organised uh, many, many trips uh, over to, to help refugees with me, and has got an amazing story, uh, because she's also a foster carer. So welcome, Sally. Thank you, Sarah. And can I say, when I started reading Sue's book this afternoon, I had sort of happy moments and sad memories, and most of which I shared with Sarah at some point or other. Um, I must say, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Bren Brendan Woodhouse, because Brendan's actually watching us now. And I just want to share his story, because although the NEU has been fantastic and brilliant, other unions were involved as well. I think a flash of inspiration was when the Fire Brigade Union took a fire engine full of donations to the Care for Cali warehouse and then took it to what was left of the Dunkirk camp and all the kids piled on the, on the fire engine. You can imagine what happened when they went back through, through border control. And the, the whole thing was searched from bo bottom to top. So people did amazing things and carry on doing amazing things. But it wasn't just the practical aid. It wasn't just the teaching in the school. You know, our union 
Union, the International Education Union, I'm very proud of because what they also did was, was start producing teaching materials so people could take the, 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 their stories back to school and tell and, and, and tell their pupils. Even during lockdown, I'm hearing reports of people doing coats for Calais in their schools and, 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 do, and using Refugee Week. And if any of you are homeschooling, Refugee Week, that one of my one members used a book called The Boy at the Back of the Class. If you want to get your kids at home reading a fantastic book then I'm sure it's available from bookmarks but I think the other thing is, is about being the voice of the voiceless is he's um, Sarah mentioned that I'm a foster carer and can I say it was an absolute honor to have Hussein in our lives an absolute honor he was a joy he'd spent 10 months chasing lorries in, in, through Dunkirk miserable months risking his life and yet as soon as he found a bit of safety and security he blossomed he became student of the year he you know he did he started doing a BTEC acting course because he wanted to be an actor not just any actor a famous actor of course and the, the problem was it was for two over two years this this child who was just blossoming all over the place making friends had this cloud over his head and the cloud was a home office and can you imagine you know what, what you know every every time the letterbox goes the postman comes he's running down says is it my letter from the home office is it my letter from the home office so for over two and a half years he went through that and then the day arrived when the dreaded letter from the home office came and as a, as a, a, a teacher for many many years I tell you the home office needed a, I needed a big red pen and I wanted to send it back and say don't be so ridiculous so we had to start a campaign now, I've been a lifelong uh, anti-racist campaigner but can I I say what happened next was an inspiration for me because we contacted his, 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 his college, Leeds College, and we said to the college, and we said, look, this is what's happening. Can you write letters of support? Well, they didn't just write letters of support. They organised a petition that went to thousands overnight, and it was the pupils, and it was his fellow classmates, and it was and it, and it was his, his, his teachers who launched that petition. Then they had a demonstration de demonstration around Leeds on a, on, a, on a cold, wet night, marching through with Hussein must stay, Hussein must stay. And then it came to court day, and court day was so important because it was a horrible moment but then I was outside I you know just was, was waiting for things to happen and a coach load of kids turned up they piled out Hussein must stay the home office security guard when it nearly went into into what collapse mode and, and I said it's okay we'll sort it kids stay on the pavement you know don't don't go on the steps of home office don't shout because it's this other court cases of you performing the second coach arrived, and this time they had banners, at which point G4S was going to have a heart attack until one of the kids came up to him and gave him a big hug and said, hello, Uncle Stanley, all right. Anyway, long story short, Hussein got leave to remain that day. And what was important is all those kids who said it's not just Hussein's story, it's lots of people's story, and they have become lifelong campaigners. My final thing is what we do now. See, it's not, it's not easy getting to camps anymore, is it? But people are still doing things. Care for Cali is supporting, uh, supporting refugees who are house in hotels we've got this big big uh, day of action coming up on march the 20th the day of action and being a, a teacher of course i have my 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 thing ready you know whatever you can do you do on that day whether it's with your neighbors whether it's in your own house march the 20th very very important to shout uh, refugees must stay and the final thing to say is is that uh, i wanted to give this to sue tonight because of what's happened over stanford unfortunately i can't give it to a um, literally so I'll just give it to her virtually thank you so much for inviting me to speak tonight and thank you so much for this book so I've got my tissues ready thank you Sally fantastic always to, to hear the, the, the story and I think the book that you recommended uh, bookmarks just uh, flashed up there which is a, a book that you can use for all those uh, unlucky parents that are homeschooling at the moment um, so we are trying our best uh, to do as much as we can as teachers. Uh, I'm going to ask Prue Waldorf to speak next. Who Prue's been a, a volunteer in Samos and coordinated the Refugee Solidarity uh, Summit. So uh, welcome, Prue. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. I've been your sound's been going in and out a little bit for me. Um, such an honour to be here and to um, hear everybody speak. And um, thanks, Sue, so much for for making this project happen. Um, I know that I speak on behalf of so many volunteers. I, I've got a, a chapter featured in the book um, which focuses on the Greek island of Samos and particularly 
the kind of period of time when the um, EU Turkey deal came into into action when I was actually there on the island at that time. And I feel as though for many of us, being invited to make this contribution actually gave us the opportunity to reflect because we're also kind of in this action mode where we're, we're thinking about the next thing and the next thing that we barely have time to check in with actually what had come before. And, you know, to really remember some of those things, to actually kind of go a little bit deeper into them. And for me, I found the process of thinking about it and writing it actually quite difficult, but very cathartic, actually. I felt that it enabled me to kind of to express things, you know, and I feel that the reason that it was so important for myself and I'm sure for others was this this sense of being able to redistribute the power a little bit around who gets to speak about their experiences and who gets to tell the story and what narrative gets heard, because there's a very dominant narrative around refugees and, and migrants. And it's not one of humanity, as we know, it's one of securitization, of threat, of cultural scarcity, you know, all this, these ideas are so prevalent. And to have these human accounts, which didn't come from the perspective that certain, you know, when you get a heartfelt piece in the press, it's always very othering, it's quite patronizing, you know, it really kind of demeans people who are seeking refuge, it kind of sets them apart from us, you know, encourage us to feel pity and the like. These accounts are about solidarity, they're about people that stood side by side for days, weeks, years with people and collaborated in trying to make things better. Um, and many of us were just very embedded, you know, we were seeing people on a daily basis working alongside them. Um, and although they should be the people whose voices are directly heard, unfortunately, the way that our world is, is a lot of the time the people that most need to be heard don't have that access and the volunteers and our experiences are almost the next thing because it's testimony, testimony that otherwise wouldn't be part of history. If you look back at history, you know, you get this overall narrative about guts and glory and pride and men usually, and you know, quite, quite um, notably, of a huge majority of the people involved in volunteering in this particular case are women you know, which I'm particularly proud of. Women of all ages and experiences, backgrounds, um, economic backgrounds from all over the place. So that's a really important point. So there's that. And there's my kind of volunteer hat. Um, and then to speak a little bit about the um, Refugee Solidarity Summit. So when I returned from volunteering, I was, as I'm sure many people that had the same experience as me, quite broken quite burnt out you know it's a very thankless task not that thanks is what we're seeking but you're pushing 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 against this huge systemic force with very little resources very little capacity very little experience we were largely unsupported by large NGOs by UNHCR by other uh, remitted organizations and states you know quite the opposite we faced constant pressure you know for the work we were doing um and that takes its toll and the ability to kind of be okay with that and to even consider sustaining the work and sustaining the action when you can't even tend to your own experiences is is quite difficult and many people who were doing amazing work were becoming quite burnt out you know they were experiencing isolation they were struggling they were feeling um, very disconnected from other people. So the idea behind the summit was kind of part of a larger piece of work that I've been thinking about for years, but working with my, my colleagues and a huge network of people because the summit was not the work of a small group. It was a collaborative process where we invited contributions from the entire network. Um, we decided to create a container space, a container space where we could come together be reflective, support each other, strategize, look at what comes next. You know, how do we sustain? How do we transform the way that we work? How do we stop ourselves from replicating the same broken systems that we see going on in, you know, 
states and with large NGOs. H how do we be different and how do we sustain? How do we be resilient? So the summit, we had our first one exactly around right about exactly this time last year, a year ago, and we had around a thousand people across two days from 250 organizations, but also many, many individuals, because as you'll all know, those of you that are volunteers, we're not really organizations. You know, we're mostly individuals kind of grouping together in these disparate groups with a kind of umbrella over us. Um, and it it was an amazingly amazing event, very, very revealing. Um, lots of stuff came up and um, very sadly, we weren't able to continue with much of it because just after the summit, you know, unfortunately the pandemic hit and that really changed the landscape for everybody. It pushed a lot of people into a emergency mode. But I know I'm running out of time here, so I'll get this in very quickly. We are still working on the themes um, and the things that came up at the summit. And we're actually working on doing another um, convening of the network, which is going to be slightly different because obviously it's going to be online. It's not going to be one event. It's going to be a series of workshops and sort of outputs and happenings that happen throughout this year. So check in um, the Refugee Solidarity Summit website um, and have a look at our socials, keep an eye out. And we'd love everybody to get involved. We'd love to widen that circle and have more people there as part of the event. Um, so yeah, that's it from me. Uh, thanks for having me here, Sue. Thank you so much, um, Prue. And I remember coming to, to your summit. Um, it was kind of the last, almost the last thing that we did uh, before life changed so drastically. So we look forward to being able to to to, to come to more events like that. So thank you for, for co coordinating and, and, and speaking about it. Um, I'm going to introduce Nizara, who's our next uh, speaker, Nizara. Ahmed Tasevic, uh, who's been chronicling uh, refugee issues in, in the Balkans. So welcome, Nizara. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for uh, having me here and for uh, giving me opportunity to uh, write about the situation in the Balkans together with uh, my colleague, Jack Sapok. It was a very interesting experience and very important for me uh, to be part of uh, such, such an international uh, project. Uh, but also, uh, I, I, I use that opportunity as well as um, this tonight um, to tell that um, not all of us are uh, for the first time uh, facing uh, what some are calling refugee crisis, migration crisis, or um, anything. Um, I'm coming from the other side. Uh, for me, uh, this crisis and... Um, for me personally, I saw the ugly face of Europe that is not welcoming, that is not open for people who are running from war back in the 90s, during my war in Bosnia-Herzegovina, during genocide. I was a refugee for only one year, going through three different EU countries. Back then it was not EU, but you, today all of these countries are members. And in none of them, I was welcome. I had to cross the borders. Uh, um, in, in an irregular way, I had to hide. I lived hide. I lived without papers. So, and it's 30 years ago uh, for me, and that's very sad. Uh, I feel like Europe doesn't remember. And if you forget this crisis as quickly as you forget my crisis, then you are in deep trouble. Uh, and that's that's sad that uh, Europe and Europeans need to be reminded every little while and that we have to keep telling to Europeans, especially in the North, never again. Never again for the Holocaust, never again for genocide, never again for all the sufferings the refugees are going through. And it happens again and again and again. I live in Bosnia, in Sarajevo, and uh, at the moment, Nobody knows how many people are stuck in the Balkans. They're stuck here because of the EU borders that are guarded, guarded uh, by police officers who are using violence to push people back. 
Europe don't want any more people. At least they don't want people coming from the global south. They don't want people who are different from them for whatever reason. They don't give us a chance. We are together with people on the move. We people who are living here in the Balkans are stuck behind the walls of Europe. And I don't see the way at the moment after I have been spending half of my life in, in this very strange life, being refugee, coming back to the middle of the war in Sarajevo, because for me it was better to be under the siege than to be a refugee in one of the European countries where everybody looked at me from above. And I didn't feel like a human being for that year. And I felt again as a human when I came back, find a way, very difficult way to enter a siege of Sarajevo. And I survived it. And now I have to survive this. It's not easy for anybody in Bosnia. For us, this is deeply re-traumatizing. Not only these pushbacks, you know, if you go to, to the border area, you can hear screams of people coming from the direction of European Union. You almost can hear how policemen, police officers are hitting them, yelling in them, shooting in them. And for us, we are surviving what we had to survive in the 90s. And we are saying never again. And we are saying open the borders because this Europe is not good. Not for us, not for you or anybody in the world. There is no change. The volunteers will not bring the change. The only change are open borders. And the only change is that we are all equal, that we have the same rights and we have the same freedoms. freedoms that we are all just humans and nothing else. Not refugees, not migrants, not this, not that. We are all just people. I am as human as you are. Please open the borders for us. Don't do anything else. Don't send humanitarian aid. Don't send donations. Don't come to the Balkans to be part of this. Open the borders and give us equal chance to live a life that you are living. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natara. P powerful words. Um, I, I, before you go, I saw a question in the chat which said, um, how can people donate? Um, do, do, do you have anything? I know you, you, you just said you don't want donations, but do, do, is there an answer to that question, an easy one? Yes, there is the answer to that question. Collect the money and when the people who are struggling to cross the borders, to enter the EU, enter the EU, finally, they need your help. Be there for them. Tell them that they are welcome. Buy them shoes, phones, and clothes that the Croatian, Hungarian, Romanian, Bulgarian, Greek, or any other police destroyed on their way toward the Europe. Hug them. Open your eyes. Open your soul. Open your minds for them. And uh, they will be fine. We will be fine together. There is a huge solidarity network here. We are here for people who are here. We stand together with them and we know what they are going through because we survived this and we know they can make it. So send us a message that they can make it and go in front of your parliament, go in front of the offices and demand open the borders, nothing else. That's all that we need. We will buy shoes, food, rice and whatever we need for ourselves. Just open the fucking borders. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nizara. Powerful message. I'm going to move on to Mustafa. Uh, Mustafa Jaju. Hello, Mustafa, and welcome. Uh, Mustafa was a refugee from Gambia, now lives in Palermo, and is helping to support recent refugees. So uh, the floor is all yours, Mustafa. Okay, okay. Yeah, I am, I am Mustafa Jaju and I am from the Gambia. Uh, right now I'm staying here in, in, in Italy, in Palermo. So yes, I am among those uh, thousands and thousands of young people, men and women, who made their way uh, through, through Europe, uh, through the bad way, as some people call it as the illegal way. So I made my way through Gambia, from Gambia, then to Senegal, then from Senegal to Mali, uh, from Mali to Burkina Faso, then Burkina Faso to Niger, then from Niger uh, to Libya, and then Libya. Finally, I took the Mediterranean Sea, across the Mediterranean Sea to arrive here in, in in Italy. That was in 2015. So I would also like to uh, say special salutations to Sui Gle, who has been 
organizing this thing and of course all other people who are working together because I think that it's very important that we bring such kind of stories on the doorstep of the people because there are many people who are not aware of all these injustices that are happening to, uh, to, to migrants and to refugees. So I think it's very important that you work and then bring all these stories to the uh to the people so the people will be aware of this thing we all have things we all can do something some people some people can write some people can speak up so in any way or the other we are all uh good in doing something you have to speak up you cannot just sit down and then you know what things uh doing that's not what you know represent us uh, of course today i am here i'm not representing myself but i'm representing other people people who are in the move people who are in the balkans people who are in the in, in greece people who are in ventimilla so i'm also representing all those people especially those that are in libya i don't know whether you guys uh, have heard the stories of libya people who are uh, prisons in the cells of libya they uh, just because they have only chosen to express their freedom of movement and it's also a shame that there are some uh, european countries who are collaborating with uh, with the Libyan militants in order to torture these people, in order to torture these young people, in order to dishumanize them, to humiliate them. Uh, for me, I think this is a big shame because when I was in Africa, I never thought Europe would do such a thing. So I think these are things that we need to stop. As I'm speaking right now, even here in Palermo, we are having uh, some problems. Problems like, uh, for instance, there are many people who are uh, not going to school, they have left school. Uh, uh, people who are uh, not going to school because they have many problems. Uh, and also all the challenges that we have been through, like adopting to the new system, struggling in order to get documents. I just want to tell you that documents for us, it's something very important. Because if we don't have documents here in Italy or here in Europe, it's like you are existing, but you are not living. Because Sometimes people are defined, you are defined as a human being once you have a document. Because without a document, you cannot get access to some essential services. For instance, if you are sick, you could not go to the hospital because you don't have documents. So these are the struggles that many people are going on uh, here. It's also very important to isolate some of the things that happened, let's say, here in, in Italy. Like, for instance, in 2018, there had been a law that has been introduced here in Italy regarding to, uh, to migration. That is a decret of secrets. In English, I would say the, the Salvini decree or decret of secrets or decret, uh, Sal, uh, uh, Salvini decree, exactly. This degree has left many people homeless because uh, many people who are living in the refugee centers, we are, uh, we are sent outside the refugee centers because this degree declares that they are not legal to stay there in the refugee centers. So this, uh, had been the same and it, had, it has created a negative impact in the life of uh, many, 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 many young refugees, many young migrants here. The advent of also COVID-19, which has, you know, made uh, also force many people to leave the country. For instance, here in Palermo, I have many friends who have left the countries like uh, they have been to Spain, they have been to Malta, some have been to uh, Germany because of the difficulties that they are facing here. They could no more cope with the conditions. Some, uh, some instead of you know, uh, renewing their documents, they could they were not able to renew their documents because they could not secure your jobs. So the level of illegality has increased also. So this has been many problems that we are uh, we are facing here. So what are we doing as an association? Me with other people. We, what we are doing right now is we are trying to create uh, some. Uh, we are trying to create and organize some networks of uh, solidarity and resistance in order to help people who are you know, experiencing rough sleeping and some people who are in, in this moment could not uh, afford to buy some uh, basic needs like food for themselves because they are no more going to work. They have COVID-19 have made them, you know, uh, left their job. Every, every, everywhere is locked down. So they, they could not afford uh, something for themselves. So it's very difficult. We are doing all these things because we believe that our struggle does not recognize borders. It does not recognize uh, our tribes. It does not recognize race. When I mean borders, I mean external borders and internal borders. External borders are those borders that we have created to separate other people from reaching us. And internal borders are those borders that we have created deep inside our minds. I think these are things that we need to 
get rid of that you have to separate people because of you have to you know, separate people because of they are migrants or because of they come from other 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 places somebody said here earlier that we are all equal what matters is the humanity this is what we have to promote so this is what we are doing with many uh, other people we want to create a society where all of us could call could, uh, all call home where all of us could be so this is what we have been doing in this uh, in this in, in, in this time so that we also want to return to what was once said during the uh, declaration of the american independence that is all men are born equal and that they they are endowed with certain inalienable rights uh, by their creator which is uh, life uh, freedom of life freedom of liberty and then the pursuit of happiness happiness i think everybody should you know work towards the 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 protection of all these rights nobody should be you know uh send no nobody should be uh dehumanized or done something because of he is not able uh to secure uh, a document or something else so thank you very much thank you so much uh mustafa and and um an amazing story an amazing journey and and now you're working in palermo to to help the many people there that, that that need your help. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. Our last speaker is going to be Samita Shah, who's uh, worked in, in Athens supporting refugees. So welcome, Samita. Thank you, um, Sarah. And firstly, thank you, Sue, for asking me to speak today and writing that section on Athens for the book. Now, I'm a writer in my day job and never did I think I would be writing a piece for a book documenting the worst of European government policies on how refugee lives matter and documenting human rights abuses. So this has sort of also been a bit of a wake up call reading parts of the book. The three main points I want to just quickly cover, I'm going to talk about the pushbacks, criminalization of aid workers and future of camps in Greece and, and all in sort of five or six minutes. So firstly, while the numbers of displaced people in Greece at the end of 2020 is just under 120,000, there's actually been a drop in arrivals from previous years and um, partly due to the COVID situation, but also from illegal pushbacks. And this illegal pushback situation is actually quite a serious issue. So reports from 2020 indicate multiple incidents where the Greek Coast Guard, sometimes accompanied by armed masked men, unlawfully abandoned migrants at sea on inflatable boats, or they towed them to Turkish waters. In some of those most extreme cases, they intercepted they attacked and they disabled boats carrying migrants. So these reports also indicate illegal pushbacks by border officials at the Evros land border with Turkey. And many of these pushbacks have been people who have reached Greece. So at this point, they should legally have been able to claim asylum, but instead, they have randomly and indiscriminately been arrested and pushed back to Turkey. So the NGOs and the EU have been calling for Greece to not only refrain from these practices, but to actually launch an independent investigation. Now, Greece, of course, is denying that this is actually happening. So we'll be watching to see what happens in this space. Now, in terms of criminalization of aid workers, the argument of all countries pursuing this policy is to remove what they perceive to be the pull factors. So Greece continues to try to block groups of aid workers and makes arbitrary accusations. And volunteers have been, and they continue to be accused of facilitating smuggling and trafficking. So why is this happening? Many of the arrests are direct consequences of a badly worded EU directive from 2002. And this directive was supposed to prevent 
human trafficking within the EU. But it was left up to member states to define what is criminal and what is humanitarian assistance. Greece is therefore really pushing the boundaries on these definitions, often with baseless accusations and lack of evidence. Unfortunately, the overall effect of these efforts by Greece and other countries have done nothing to dim that so-called core factor. All that's actually happening is that there is a higher death rate for those who try to cross the waters to reach Greece. Now, we'll probably come back to this point about criminalization of aid workers when we try to answer Tess's first question. Now, just over four months ago, in the middle of the pandemic, a fire raged through the Lesbos Moria Reception Centre, destroying the whole of what was already known as the Hell on Earth camp. At that time, the EC Home Affairs Commissioner Johansson said the poor conditions were partly responsible for the circumstances that led to the fire. And she also stated there will be no more Morias. Well, famous last words. So currently the new temporary site has been set up on an old military base right on the seafront on Lesbos. It's been four months and many aspects of the winterization and the hygiene and the health and safety aspects of setting up a camp have been missed. And it's been left to medium sized NGOs and grassroots organizations to fill many of these gaps in addressing these appalling conditions. The most recent health issue is that we found high levels of lead in parts of this camp. This obviously is leading to further and urgent calls by NGOs to move people to better accommodation. Now, Greece initially had plans to construct new prison-like closed facility detention centres. And, and this obviously has created some uproar. So a new Moria 2 facility is still planned. But the latest news is, in fact, that it will be an open facility. Now, this could change because this sort of information changes on a week by week basis. But it appears that plans have stalled. The plans have led to opposition from the resident communities. So maybe the government is re-evaluating what it needs to do. However, the Samos camp is ready and it's got the ISO boxes installed. But as yet, people have not been moved into this, these ISO boxes. The final point that I just want to make, now, one of the biggest, biggest problems that I see, and one that I think we may want to discuss and debate as part of this dialogue that we're having, you know, with the sort of volunteer community, how much can the EU continue to say that it recognises the horrible inhumane conditions that people fleeing from wars are living in in Greece? But then rather than try to tackle this, instead it keeps throwing millions of euros at Greece to allow it to keep people in these horrible conditions. And then Greece continues to enact these inhumane policies without there being any sanctions. So I think this is something that as a community, we maybe need to start thinking about how do we try and address this issue. I'm going to stop there and then hand back over to Sarah. Thank you very much, um, Sunita, and, and thank you to all the speakers for, for keeping uh, to time. Um, Sue, did you want to make any um, sort of closing remarks or flag up any uh, comments from the chat that uh, you wanted to bring forward and perhaps give us some thoughts about where we go next? Yeah, just really briefly again, thank, thanks so much everyone. And I think what everyone always wants to know is what can be done, you know, what could, I mean, 
as Nizara pointed out, you know, you can donate, but donations isn't the end of it. But it doesn't mean to say donations aren't needed given it's winter. Um, I'm sure people can post up all the relevant groups. Donate for Refugees is a good place to start. Um, you can donate, you can campaign. I think the important things to campaign around is a lot of speakers that Sunita's just mentioned in particular, is that in the EU and in Britain, there's not enough distinction being made in law for people who do humanitarian acts. So that all over the EU, if, if, if say, the people in Ventimiglia, which is the Italian French border, um, there, there were trying. There, were, there was a, a guy who just was trying to take two women to hospital who needed to go to hospital, and he had to cross from Italy to France, and he was fined. I think it was forty thousand euros and accused of people trafficking just because he crossed a border trying to get to a, a hospital. And the whole district of Calais that was operating, you couldn't feed or offer shelter to a refugee person. So anytime any of us were moving people around, we're accused of trafficking. And also Sean Binder and Sarah Mardini are quite, um, it's a well-known case, as was Carola Rocchetti. You know, these are people who were doing sea rescues and who were who were facing 25 years in jail. And Sean and Sarah still are facing 25 years in jail for people trafficking. And they were called the Libyan Taxi Service because they were, you know, people were leaving Libya in boats that weren't going to make it. And they were saving their lives um and so the law has got to st and the same with the Stansted 15 you know they've been through hell in the last two years being being accused of you know being convicted of terrorism um for doing a, a peaceful humanitarian act so i think one thing we have to keep working at in terms of our campaigning is and this what this book tries to do is redefine humanitarianism because the term still sometimes sounds a little bit like put some money in the Oxfam tin, you know what I mean? It's There's still overtones of, oh, charity, little aid groups. I've had very patronising people tell me, oh, yes, you send little pairs of socks to poor little refugees, all that stuff. There's all this idea still attached to being a, being volunteers, but this is a new humanitarianism that is equally, if not more so, about rights and about opening borders and about acknowledging humanitarian principles and getting us back to subscribing to international protocols and agreements and we have to stand up for that and maybe think of a new language and the volunteers I think have started to do that you know a new way of talking about being a good citizen welcoming supporting others so it's not just the specific campaigns like the Dobbs amendment and um better conditions in the camps in Moria, they're all incredibly important, but is somehow trying to think of a new way to talk about the humanitarian movement and make sure that um, the law and other institutions recognize what we're doing as, 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 as humanitarian acts and not as, um, you know, not as a crime. But I'd love to know what, 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 you know, what, what more specific practical suggestions or comments people who've been listening might have i'm just looking in the in the chat to to see if there's uh, anything suggested there I, I think um there's been a lot of engagement uh, and and people uh saying that how much they've uh, enjoyed hearing from everybody and and that this issue has has come back to the the fore, and and it's reminded a lot of people of, um, you know, times they've been out to help, and and uh, that people are still passionate about about this about this issue. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's possibly time to bring to a close, um, unless anybody waves at me with any urgent final comments. I, th I think, did Sumita have something to say? And also, I don't know if, Tufik, you've got anything to say about the current campaigns with the barracks and the fire and the Folkestone situation as well. Can I, can I just maybe add um, or sort of try and answer a little bit of Tess's question? She had a, a question mm -hmm. about, you know, with the, with the sort of results of the Stanford 15 case, will it end this sort of rhetoric around, um, you know, criminalisation of volunteers? And... Mm -hmm. One of the things I want to say is I no, I don't think it will it will do that yet because what we need to work on is we need to change that rhetoric of 
you know, this, this sort of message that refugees are not welcome, that they're not somehow worthy of being in Europe you know, that they deserve less than us. And that's a very much, you know, part of this sort of right-wing rhetoric that, that does need to be changed. And, you know, our, Sir Alf, uh, Lord Alf Dubs mentioned sort of this, I, you know, we need to open borders, we need to have clear paths for asylum without having to, you know, people having to cross these dangerous waters and make these horrible journeys, sometimes for two to three to five years. And I, I mentioned the EU directive around sort of um, the 2002 directive earlier, and, and there's possibly other sort of European law. And one of the things that we as volunteer community can do is try and change and lobby and change for these definitions around what is trafficking, what is, you know, the definition of humanitarian work. and. And, and I think that's sort of a part of the bigger picture because we're all dealing with what's on the ground and we're, you know, we're dealing with that well and we're working at the grassroots level, but we need to somehow come in at this top level. And this book yeah. is a really good starting point, but we need to come in at that higher level as well. Thank you. And I, and I hope, sorry, if I could just say so, um, yeah. when Prue mentioned the Refugee Solidarity Summit events, I hope we've discussed that, you know, that, that once people have read the book and please buy it and please spread the word, you know, that then we can actually convene as the big issues around criminalizing of volunteers as well as refugees, which is, you know, very daunting for, for everyone. Violence, police state violence against volunteers as well as refugees and also care. You know, we haven't really talked about self-care, but as Prue said, you know, an awful lot of volunteers burnt out and suffered really bad PTSD and trauma because we weren't trained. I mean, even Brendan will say that as a trained firefighter who ought to be exactly the sort of person that could handle emergency situation. Nobody was trained to do what, what was what was going on. So there are lots of issues that I hope people will come to the summit if they're interested for those kinds of discussions about particular, you know, practical issues and bigger issues and legal issues. Um, but yeah, is there anything specific to the UK that people should be addressing right now, given the given the barracks situation? Does anyone have an update mm -hmm. on what's happened? I, I know that um, Help Refugees are carrying a campaign at the moment, which is about mm -hmm. lobbying MPs. Um, mm -hmm. My colleague, my summit colleague, colleague Maddie Harris. Um, mm -hmm also has an organisation for, called Humans for Rights Network and they've been very closely involved in documenting um, and, and taking accounts from people that are in the Napier barracks. Mm -hmm. um, so there's quite a lot of kind of momentum happening around that at the moment. The, the only campaign I'm aware of is the Help Refugees um, mm -hmm. carrying something on their website. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that, yeah, it's just about, I think, making a distinction. Personally, I think it's about the fact that we shouldn't look at these as isolated things that happen in different yeah. countries. It's all one web. Yeah. And it's definitely intentional. You know, this is not accidental. You know, this is a lack of political will. It's, it's, it's a decision that's being made and it's playing out through all of the countries in Europe and elsewhere in the world. And I think that... I kind of feel like, of course, volunteering and advocating and all those things are really important, but I think we have to sort of go a little bit deeper as well and say, you know, where is this, how are we permitting this? How are our societies allowing mm. this to happen? How is this slide into kind of accepting these sorts of conditions happening? I know that we're all suffering under COVID, that there's a culture of scarcity, that there's economic pressures, lots of stuff that divides us, but, we are sliding gradually and gradually into a much more frightening right-wing uh, Europe. And that's being played out everywhere. Mm. Um, and we are, to a certain extent, permitting that. Because each time they kind of move things a little bit further in a direction, it, it, it happens, it happens. You know, So I think it's kind of about saying, what are we afraid of facing in ourselves, in our own history? Mm. You know, and... and what N Nadara said never again you know I feel like that's really really my takeaway from this session is like we have to think about that one you know unifying so 
the summit is a place where we can have those kind of discussions. You're all invited. Please come. And also, although there's a lot of things that people need funding for, one thing we're finding with this summit is we're too political. It's very hard to get the event funded. So we're going to be looking mm -hmm. at the subscription model and we're going to need your support to make things mm -hmm. happen in the future. So mm -hmm. I'll let you know more about that via mm -hmm. socials. But I'll shut up now. <laughs> I, I would also love to make more. I mean, we, we're talking about making connections with Extinction Rebellion because you and you and gave a talk in, in the UK when it was when he came over once about the fact that climate change is obviously a massive going to be a massive cause of much more uh, migration so making more connections with extinction rebellion making more connections with black lives matter mm -hmm. making strengthening connections with the trade union movement which is why i was pleased that bookmarks you know offered to hold this because they're you know they're the trade union bookshop and place of thinking and education so i think that's i think proves right you know all these movements have got to come together we can't just we're not just these in we we thought we were individual volunteers because we were sort of flung out there in that in that way and a lot of people were really on their own but now we're back you know we've come back we've got to consolidate and really join forces with all these other movements can i just say i think the the other thing is what happened over the summer with the black lives matter because actually what we saw in the most a, a difficult time a massive polarization of the, the stuff that went on in america and then they came over to it so i do think it, yes things are challenging but there is this huge mobile uh, sorry a polarizer between left and right and, and sue's absolutely right we just got to get the left sorted and and days like the, the 20th of, of, of march will give us an opportunity even if we're in little boxes to actually get together and bring in more people and all the youngsters who took the knee over the summer etc i i think we've, we've got a bit of, of a chance here because obviously when we talk about refugees being welcome we're also talking about black lives Matter. Yeah. we're also talking about saving the planet we're also talking about everything else but and i also think we should always make sure we use bookmarks as a bookshop before amazon <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you Sally. you 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 just um I think you've posted uh, on Facebook the the link to the 20th of March, which is the United Nations uh, Anti-Racist Day of Action worldwide. So hopefully we can get together and um, uh, and keep up this campaign um, to to keep anti-racism and and refugee rights in, in the public eye. Um, so I think I'm heading to a closure. Did you want to mention anything in, in as a final comment? Oh, it was just someone's put up the crowd justice link, which I, excellent. Is yeah. that in, in the Facebook comments? Yeah, it's in the yeah, it's, it's in the Facebook comments. Crowdjustice.com, which is another way of working towards changing these kind of um, oppressive, okay. hostile environment laws that we've got. Brilliant. Well, can I um, close by saying thank you to to all the speakers. Uh, thank you particularly to to Sue for, for pulling this book together and and bringing us all uh, together. And and of course to to, to Alf Dobbs who um, was going off to another event, one of the the busiest uh, people on the circuit. Um, but we we appreciate him coming and contributing to to the book. Uh, so thank you everybody keep up the struggle and let's let's get this book um so in, in circulation and 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 read and recommend and and we can uh keep this conversation going so thank you everybody and and thank you Sue, and and good night thank you. <laughs> <laughs>